Hello all. Today is very important topic. We learn in different books, types and indications of fluids but never get an idea on how to administer it with a plan for days to weeks especially in ER, ICU or ward settings. I'll present Rose conceptual model by International Fluid Academy something you can relate and apply anywhere with ease. Let's see then. The key indications of fluids include three, namely resuscitation fluids, replacement fluids and maintenance fluids, keeping in mind fluid creep as fourth component. Resuscitation as the name suggests is emergency measure to cover the deficit and restoring the circulatory volume for preserving life. It may include balanced crystalloids, normal saline, blood transfusions, albumin. Replacement fluid as the name suggests is replacing the ongoing losses be it electrolytes, water or blood depending on case to case basis. It should mimic the ongoing fluid loss in question. For example, normal saline for ongoing vomiting, Ringer's lactate for ongoing diarrhea and damage control resuscitations in trauma for ongoing blood losses. The third category is that of maintenance fluids that is the fluid covering the maintenance requirements of body including water, electrolytes and glucose to support basic requirements for normal functioning at cellular level. We have discussed in last episode on dextrose based crystalloids used in maintenance fluids. Any excess fluid given for line patency, drug vehicle or panic surplus given as in burns is categorized in fluid creep that has its own adverse effects. Why do we give fluids? The goal is to sustain life and life is sustained by oxygen delivery into tissues, right? We know that delivery of oxygen is arterial oxygen content multiplied by cardiac output. Any reduction in one or both of these two factors will cause reduced delivery of oxygen and hypoperfusion or ischemia. So what should be your target while giving fluids? If restrictive fluid therapy is used, it can lead to underhydration, which can reduce the delivery of oxygen, worsen the prognosis and studies show strong association with acute kidney injury. On the flip side, liberal fluid therapy can cause overhydration causing edema in the lungs, fluid creep. In both situations, oxygen movement into the cell is affected, convective or diffusion issues. So there must exist a sweet spot of euvolemia or optimal fluid therapy which means there must be a dedicated calculated start and stop points for fluid administration, right? Which further means there must be certain assessment tools guiding towards start and stop points or targets, right? The assessment tools are traditional static ones or advanced dynamic ones. In case of static traditional tools, these include the clinical assessment tools such as skin, tongue, fontanelle, capillary refill time, suggesting percentage of water loss in a very crude way. Similarly, blood pressure, pulse and urine output can give assessment of status of hydration and volume losses, example ones used to calculate blood losses in trauma cases. CVP, pulmonary artery catheter and tools calculating pulmonary artery occlusion pressures or end diastolic pressures. Now these are all poor predictors of fluid status and are subject to a lot of variations depending upon the vascular resistance, comorbidities and can give false positives or negatives. Still, they are dependable because clinical tools are still cornerstone of your management in ER, emergency or less facility areas where more advanced tools are not available. So never underestimate their usefulness. Now why dynamic advanced measures are more precise tools? Because they are goal directed meaning they precisely check for cardiac output response to preloads or fluid responsiveness. So more targeted optimization of cardiac output to preserve delivery of oxygen to tissues can be done, right? This includes pulse pressure variations, stroke volume variations or systolic pressure variations in response to raising cardiac preload by bolus fluid regimens or maneuvers like an expiratory occlusion test or passive leg raising of 30 degrees. So transthoracic or transesophageal echo are key monitoring tools for goal directed fluid therapies. One key target is checking for lactate since tissue hyperperfusion would lead to anaerobic metabolism and production of lactate. Lactate is an important marker of delivery of oxygen to tissues. 
in other words it is a vital marker of balance between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism at tissue level lactate is also good prognostic marker for trauma cases idly bringing lactate levels below 2 within 24 hours of trauma assault by effective resuscitation carries a very good prognosis and vice versa so watch for lactate always remember individualizing with case to case variation holds the key to good fluid therapy this means good medical knowledge about the disease combined with latest protocols and research for example resuscitation for trauma sepsis protocols are different similarly type of surgery is important like restrictive fluid strategy for thoracic cases but latest research says it can adversely affect the kidneys so world is tilting towards moderate fluid strategy in thoracic cases now efficiency of fluids in acute hypovolemia and role of endothelial glycocalyx membrane which we covered in the first episode of this chapter the fluids are drugs with indications contraindications and side effects as such the four d's of antibiotics apply to fluids as well drug type duration dosage and de escalation which fluid is appropriate inappropriate and where combo is good For example, normal saline may be appropriate for vomiting induced hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, but in sepsis where large amount of resuscitation fluid is required, normal saline is inappropriate as it would cause hyperchloremia and metabolic acidosis, right? Similarly, in trauma cases where if crystalloid is required more than 4 liters, why not give a combo of colloid and crystalloid to prevent fluid excess and edema? So you see individualization and medical knowledge is vital. For dosage, pharmacokinetics are key. Now the efficiency of fluid is its ability to retain in the blood stream. Studies suggest 90% crystalloid is renally excreted in normal conscious patient within 2 hours, but in general anesthesia induced blood pressure reduction, only 10% crystalloid is renally excreted in the same time frame. So efficiency of crystalloid to be retained in blood stream increases to 75% and even 100% depending upon context sensitivity. Similarly, normal saline may stay in body for many days because high chloride in normal saline causes renal vasoconstrictions and reduced excretion. The endothelial glycocalyx layer shedding during sepsis inflammation breaks the barrier of semipermeability. and giving too much fluid may cause edema with leakage of proteins into interstitium modern research supports giving albumin early in the assault to protect this fine endothelial glycocalyx layer the third part of 4 d's is duration so we know there must be some start point and stop point this will be covered in rose conceptual model of fluid therapy in the next few minutes and the fourth segment of de escalation is proactive fluid elimination from the body I'll cover this in rose concept as well. Just remember efficiency of fluids increases in general anesthesia, acute hypovolemia and dehydration cases. The take home message so far individualize. Number 2, practice the 4 Ds. Number 3, prefer target based goal directed fluid therapy approach. And number 4, do not underestimate static clinical tools in less advanced settings. they can be vital assessment guides now let's finally see the rose conceptual model for fluid management the rose conceptual model was coined by international fluid academy and i personally love it so rose is an acronym r for resuscitation o for optimization s for stabilization and e for evacuation resuscitation marked in red here should take minutes to accomplish you cannot delay it for example severe shock be it septic hemorrhagic or major burns life preservation takes priority here aim is to immediately correct the shock now the positive fluid balance through this stage is a must remember we said resuscitation quarter in fluid circle a few minutes back again individualization is important alongside the latest protocols for example Grade 3 hemorrhage requires damage control resuscitation with red cell concentrates platelets and FFPs at 1 ratio 1 ratio 1 we will cover individual issues separately in other chapters if it's burns shock it requires parkland's formula of 4 ml per kg per percentage burn half given in the first 8 hours and half in the next 16 hours 
Surviving sepsis bundle dictates liberal fluid therapy in the septic shock at even 30 ml per kg resuscitation fluid. Modern studies are tilting towards more goal-directed fluid responsiveness. We already talked through goal-directed assessment tools and how cardiac output response to preload is checked. So 3 to 4 ml per kg IV bolus over 10 to 15 minutes repeated if necessary along with vasopressor support. The next stage is optimization. Optimization phase starts when there is no longer absolute or relative hypovolemia but the patient is still hemodynamically unstable or labile. Common examples include patients under general anesthesia where relative hypovolemia can cause the blood pressure drops, similarly less severe burns and ongoing severe gastrointestinal losses with vomiting or diarrhea qualify in this category. Aim in this phase is to cater for individual needs and frequent reassessments are needed. So of course monitoring vitals is essential through this phase. Fluid balance should be zero or neutral through this phase. Ideally, the fluid challenges should continue with replacement fluids. Remember we discussed second quarter of fluid indications, the replacement fluid must mimic the ongoing losses, blood for blood, electrolytes for electrolytes, right? Once the patient is stable, stabilization phase begins and develops over days. The aim through this phase is maintenance of electrolytes, water, glucose and basic requirements of body for organ support. Fluid balance through this phase should be zero to even negative. We have covered already the maintenance quarter of fluid indication. Common examples of this include the post-operative patients who are still NPO. Now the late conservative fluid management or LCFM is having two consecutive days of negative fluid balance within a week. In days to weeks, once indication of fluid resuscitation no longer exists, lactate is normal, adequate perfusion is there and patient is recovering. He is on enteral feed, any excess fluid can be toxic and can cause increased morbidity. So de-resuscitation or evacuation phase begins where even proactive fluid removal with diuresis and renal replacement therapy ultrafiltration may be required. So you see how fluid management can be segregated into different stages depending upon the condition and medical disorder. And these stages cover the patient management from ER to OT to ICU and even wards. To summarize what we have discussed so far. First, assess the patient, the clinical tools or goal-directed advanced tools. Next, the indication of fluids. Resuscitation fluid may follow liberal guidelines or better still is latest fluid response to cardiac output goal directed at 3 to 4 ml per kg bolus in repeats. Remember rule of 1 for calculating the maintenance fluids. So 1 ml per kg per hour of water, 1 millimole per kg per day of sodium, potassium and chloride and 1 gram per kg per day of glucose to limit the starvation ketosis, keeping medical disorder and individualization in mind. Also, subtract the fluid creep or excess fluid which includes the IV drug carrier fluid, the oral intake such as coffee, tea, water intake. Practice the 4 Ds of fluid therapy. Always have a viable, methodical and justifiable 24-hour fluid management plan in place. That's it for today. In the next episode, we will shed light on fluid management in operation theater. And later on, we will also cover fluid management in burn and trauma cases. Take care.